Hello. I'm going to try and make this. Sorry. Well, good morning. And welcome to the Wisconsin Women's Health Foundation's 12th Annual Dialogue. Yay, 12, we made it for 12. <laughs> I'm Tommy Thompson, and I'm the Executive Director of the Wisconsin Women's Health Foundation. It's so great to see so many familiar faces. Thank you for coming. We really appreciate you being here. The Wisconsin Women's Health Foundation is committed to providing innovative programs that impact and improve the health and lives of Wisconsin women and families. We focus on outreach, education, connecting women to resources, and funding women's health research. As the executive director of the foundation, I've had the privilege of working alongside my mother, Sue Ann Thompson, who is our president and who founded the organization over 21 years ago. My mom is here somewhere. Oh, there she is. Thank you, Mom. My mom and I have definitely not been in the trenches alone for all these years. We've had amazing coworkers who have also been dedicated to this mission. We've also had many wonderful supporters and a large number of partners who have joined us in this important work. I would like to mention two in particular that have employees here today, the Department of Health Services and WPS Health Solutions. Thank you for your support and for being here today. The dialogue is a forum for discussing issues. We've had many interesting topics. They've been educational, thought-provoking, and this year is no exception. Let's just look at one issue we will touch on today, the opioid crisis. Experts say the U.S. is in the throes of an epidemic, as more than two million Americans have become dependent on or abuse prescription pain pills and street drugs. During 2016, there were more than 63,600 overdose deaths in the United States. That's 66% involved in opioid. That's an average of 115 opioid overdoses deaths each day. Unfortunately, Wisconsin and the other Midwestern states are leading the nation with some of the highest rates. This year's dialogue focuses on how to help our kids avoid dangers such as opioids, that can impact their lives and devastate families for years to come. We will discuss the hard conversations you need to have with your kids. We'll offer real life solutions for families to address these issues. I recently read a quote that I would like to share. It said, the quickest way for a parent to get a child's attention is to sit down and look comfortable. So today we want you to leave with the tools of how to have the tough conversations once you've gotten comfortable. Well, I think it's time to get started and really begin to dialogue on some of these issues. It is always my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, who is a true friend to the foundation, Ms. Pam Tauscher. She is a Madison celebrity. She has worked as a reporter and broadcaster for NBC 15. She is currently the host of Moms Every Day. We are so happy that she's agreed to partner with us again and bring up issues that literally moms are dealing with every day. Please join me in welcoming Pam Tauscher. Thank you. I know, it's easy to trip. Hello everybody. How are we? Good? Full? Do you eat? Say yes. There's all that lovely food over there. Well, thank you for inviting me back. I must not have screwed up last year, so that's good. Like Tommy's mentioned, by the way, we're trying to try and keep this pretty informal today. Um, you know, our, the dialogue means we're going back and forth. So uh, we're going back and forth. That means you can have seconds for food. You can go get coffee. You know, wave down the folks when they come. So we're gonna we're gonna keep it on the DL today. We're just a bunch of friends hanging out trying to figure out this this mom stuff, so, or grandparenting stuff. Like Tommy mentioned, we're discussing something parents seem to be dealing with earlier and earlier these days. It's how we can keep our kids from avoiding the dangers that could impact the rest of their lives. 
Dr. Skier studies behavioral intervention development specific to substance abuse and then preventing misuse of drugs in childhood. She will be joining us live from Boston via Skype to speak to and give evidence-based strategies for normal everyday activities like having family dinners and how that can reduce the risk of children being into substance abuse. Then we have Special Agent Heather Ryan, who is here to bust the stranger danger myths that a lot of us grew up with. And she will present facts on the physical safety and relationship violence that frightens a lot of us parents and give us practical take-home tips that apply to the conversations that we can and should be having with our kids. So I'm excited to see what both of these women have to say, and I'm, as I said, so excited to be serving as the moderator again this year to help get the scoop on what we can be doing. I'll remind you of the format for how we do things here. Uh, the speakers will each be uh, speaking. Well, one won't be at the podium, one will be on a screen, but they'll each have about 20 minutes to chat with us. And then new this year, we will have question and answers immediately following each one of their presentations so that we can stay present in the moment and focus on what they've just told us instead of bouncing back and forth like we have in years past, which worked fine, but I think we can dive deeper in hopefully with uh, this format. So as we do every year, we will ask you to submit written questions. We won't raise hands and that type of thing, but you can write down on the uh, paper on your table there and then uh, once you write it down just give a wave and we'll have volunteers coming around that can pick up your questions and we'll try to um, get to as many of them as we can with uh, Dr. Skier and with Heather. So first it is my pleasure to introduce our first expert of the day. Dr. Margie Skier is an associate professor and the interim director of the Master of Science in Health Communication at Tufts University of Medicine in the Department of Health and Community Medicine. She received her doctorate in social epidemiology from the Harvard School of Public Health and then did a two-year postdoctoral fo fellowship at the Brown Center for Alcohol and Addiction Studies. So she comes to us highly credentialed. She's been in the field of substance abuse and addiction for over 20 years now, and she currently is doing research that focuses on adolescent substance misuse prevention, both from her epidemiologic and intervention development perspectives. So her research has a particular focus then for us on family engagement and the role that family meals play in adolescent risk prevention. So interesting. A current interest is the effects of the new recreational marijuana policies on adolescent initiation, especially on parent-child communication about marijuana. And Margie also teaches graduate courses on substance use and addiction for public health and medical students. Dr. Skier also, oh, by the way, has two kids. <laughs> 10 and 7 years old, in her spare time, when I can't imagine that she has any, but she likes cooking, yoga, and spending time with her family, of course. So please give a warm Madison welcome to Margie, all the way from Massachusetts. Margie, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be there today. So I'm sorry I'm not there in person, but I'm really glad that I'm able to be able to speak with you about this issue that is very near and dear to my heart, and it's something I spend the majority of my time working on. So I'm going to be talking today about how we can talk to kids about substance use. And my goal is to really start talking, give you a little bit of background about me, sort of how I got to where I am and why I do the work that I do. And then also to give you a little bit of a background as to why this is important and then some practical strategies about how you can talk to kids about substances. So just to give you a little background about myself, I started over 20 years ago working in drug rehabilitation centers and I was working one on one with people both who were young, particularly 18 to 20 year olds, both um, people individually and in groups. I was a case manager and then I was doing counseling and then got a degree in social work, specifically focusing on addiction and working for several years in rehabilitation centers. It every day I would sort of close my door and cry and I wasn't sure I could sort of do it long term. But more importantly, the stories that I kept hearing over and over again were largely related to adversity in childhood and what the 
kids or the young people that I was working with, and I was young at the time too, what their families were like and sort of seeing the difference between my family and their families. And that really got me thinking about the importance of prevention work and focusing on family as a point that we can intervene upon. Um, and the parent-child communication is so important in that work. So I got my doctorate in intervention development. So that's what I do. I take my background in substance use and I design interventions primarily for parents on how parents can talk to their kids about substances. And the opioid epidemic has really created an opportunity for parents in many ways now because it's everywhere we're hearing about it. And yet it's still a very hard thing to do. And what I come across most often with parents is they say to me, I know I should be talking about it, but I don't know how. And that's where I come in. I try to give some practical tips. So let's talk a little bit more about the background right now. So if I were in person, I would make this a little bit more interactive and it is tough doing it remotely. So um, I will, I'm not gonna be as interactive, but one thing I like to do is ask people, why do you think people, teens or people in general use substances? So you might think about why people that you know, people in your life when you were younger, why people use substances. And so I'll go through several reasons that I think are important when thinking about this. So first, relax or escape. We see this a lot. Um, something I hear a lot of people will say, oh, I just I had a long day at work or I had a long day at, you know, work with my kids and I just, I just need a glass of wine to relax at the end of a day. Um, we use alcohol and other drugs in our society to celebrate, right? We have champagne, we have specific glasses that go with champagne. It's a celebratory thing. Even if you're trying to send a text, if you see an emoji for celebrate, champagne comes up. It's ingrained in our society around using substances to celebrate. People, young people in particular, use substances to experiment, right? They're curious. It's also a major social lubricant, especially among young people. If people are feeling socially anxious or uncomfortable, um, it's, it can be a really effective way to relax in those situations. People also use it to self-medicate, both physical and mental pain. We see that a lot. People like to lose inhibitions. I hear this over and over again. I see it in my work, right? You just, you want to set, let loose and set free and just go and do something so um, substances can help with that. This is one of the biggest things I hear with teens is we are bored, we have nothing to do. I work in nor Northern rural Idaho with teens um, around crystal meth use. And I hear that, that from them loud and clear, but I also hear it from teens in Boston who live in one of the most exciting cities in the world and they're bored. So I hear this over and over again. People just wanna get drunk or high because it's fun, right? There's a reason people do this. It's, it's not all the bad things that happen. Young people will also use substances to rebel, right? They want to just do something that they're not supposed to be doing or feel or act more grown up like that. It's also a way to fit in. Um, if your friends and peers are using, you want to be do what they're doing. So that can be a really effective tool. And young girls, young women, girls in particular, um, smoking is seen as a way to lose weight. Some people have the misperception that if you drink so much and then throw up, you can lose weight. So there are ways that actually people are using substances to lose weight as well. And that's all sort of on like the, the risk side. We think about like the things that we'd wanna work on around prevention, but also um, substances, you know, prescription drugs are used are medicinally for pain relief. Uh, we're seeing a lot of medical marijuana in our country, right? People are using it for pain relief. Um, people are also use it around cultural norms. We see this in lots of different cultures and religions. Um, substances are play a big role. Tobacco and native communities, um, in uh, Judaism and Catholicism, wine is used a lot for ritual. So we see that. Um, so and so cultural and religious. And then there's also been a lot around 
red wine has health benefits. I mean, that, some of that is being really, um, you know, contradicted, but we, I think many of us have grown up hearing, oh, have a little bit of red wine or some heart alcohol is good for you or um, using marijuana might be helpful in certain situations. So there are lots and lots and lots of reasons why people use substances. And so just to sort of couch this discussion in, all right, we know why people are using it. And it's not any one given reason. There are lots and lots of reasons. But I want to talk for a few minutes about adolescence, just so we have an understanding of what goes on during this time. So why is adolescence a risky period? So first of all, it's during this period where risk taking is, is really pronounced. Young people give more weight to the payoff associated that with risks than adults. And that has to do with the way that the brain is developing. And I'll talk about that in a second too. It's also a time for sensation seeking. And it's also a time that peers become very important. So I do work with parents or guardians of younger kids. So, you know, even sort of before puberty around talking to their teens, uh, to their preteens about substances. And what I tell them is around puberty, 12, 13, prior to that, parents are the most important people in parents or guardians are the most important people in their lives. Even if they don't think they are, they are. They're the ones they see every day, they're the ones they're listening to. But around puberty is that shift where peers start becoming more important and they're responding more to social reward and they're more novel and peers aren't telling them what to do. So that's why I think it's so important to have these conversations and to start early because you wanna have the kids sort of have this information in the back of their head so when the peers become more important, which they should, it's developmentally appropriate. It helps them for lots of different reasons down the road to form bonds with friends, to form relation, romantic relationships, to be able to leave the house at, you know, after high school or something. So it's important that it happens. It can be a very frustrating time for parents, but it's important. So the more we can do to sort of plant seeds earlier on when, when we are more important, the better off they're gonna be later on. So I'm going to show a very brief video just about what's going on in the adolescent brain around puberty. A person's most intensive period of brain development typically happens at around age 12, sixth grade. Remember puberty? At the same time their bodies are changing, kids' brains go into developmental overdrive, thickening the gray matter in the prefrontal cortex used for judgment, critical thinking, and self-control. When kids make art or they build robots or tackle stimulating academic and social challenges, their brains hardwire those neural connections. Neuroscientists call that sprouting. At the same time, the brain sheds the excess connections it doesn't use on a regular basis to make processing more efficient. Neuroscientists call that pruning. So if kids don't reinforce all those neural connections, they risk getting pruned. Moral of the story? If you're looking for the peak time to optimize a person's brain development, it's in middle school, sixth grade. Okay, so that was just a brief video to show you what's going on. And um, basically what happens is during the sort of the years starting in puberty, the brain goes through this massive restructuring where you saw the neural sprouting and pruning and where we see that, that path pathways of connections in the brain are really getting solidified or they're going away. And that process starts happening around puberty and really doesn't end until the mid to late 20s, um, particularly with boys or men later, you know, 27 can be 27, 28. So it's amazing that during this time, we're seeing such an incredible development and it's not the development, but it's this restructuring. And so what teens are doing during all of those years are what is going to sort of solidify in the brain. 
And so if you think about young people who start using substances earlier on and they're doing it daily, those are the pathways that are going to set and that makes them much more susceptible for addiction and dependence down the road. And so this is just a, an image of uh, a time-lapse MRI of the brain, of human brain development between ages 5 and 20. And it shows the gradual loss of gray matter, which, okay. I found this on the web which consists online. of um, cells that process information. And the thinning of gray matter starts around puberty and corresponds with increases in cognitive abilities. And it's probably reflecting improved neural organization. So as this brain, the brain is pairing redundant connections and increasing white matter to help the brain cells communicate. So I say that just to let you know, I mean, a lot of times parents will say, I don't know what my teen was thinking, right? But we see from this that it, they actually, the part of the brain back here that is starting to develop more, or is developed more in, around puberty is really around emotion, about you know, things that feel good. It's not until much later that up here where the part around decision-making is fully developed. So when they say, I don't know what they were thinking, the truth is they might not have really been able to think in the way that we do. So you know, teens aren't small adults. Their brains are much, much different. So that decision-making is something that we as parents need to really help with because the more we tell them, if we tell them things over and over and over and over again, that's how it's gonna stick. So that's why it's important that we start early and we continue messages throughout because it's not gonna be till later that their brain will be able to really process everything. We also know that perceived risk of substances is associated with use. So as perceived risk goes down, use tends to go up. And this is a graph um, showing sort of the inverse relationship. And with something like marijuana, the more that young people perceive it to be less risky, and as the laws continue to change, my percept my belief is that use will start going up. And we're we're we haven't been able to see this as much yet because the laws haven't been in effect as long, but I believe that this is gonna have an important impact on teen use for lots of different reasons. But um, that's why I think it's important that we really have these conversations. And also just to put out there the sort of alarming statistic that nine out of 10 people with substance problems started using substances before the age of 18. So, not to say that everybody who starts using before they are 18 will develop a problem with substances, but those who do have problems started when they were younger. And again, part of that has to do with the brain development, priming the brain to become susceptible and used to substances later on. So this is why it's so critical that we do the prevention work. Um, and so the final piece on this is this, graph shows that um, the blue is, I'm sorry, on the very bottom is the age that people started using alcohol. And the blue is the, the percentage of those who used alcohol at that age, whoever used illegal drugs. Um, and the, blue, the red is the percentage of those by age who ever were dependent on illegal drugs. And you can see those who started using before the age using alcohol before the age of 14, about 50% of them had ever used illegal, illicit drugs and close to one in five became dependent compared to those who started using alcohol after 21 and 21 or older, that less than one in 10 ever used illicit drugs and 1% became dependent. So just again, to show, even if we focused on delaying the use of substances, it would help. Each year we can delay, it will be a benefit. Okay, so I keep talking about the word prevention. Prevention so important. I'm a preventionist, I do prevention work, so what does this mean? And again, if I, if I were there, I would ask you to sort of shout out some definitions of what prevention is. And inevitably, when I ask that question, people in the room say, you know what, it's about stopping bad things before they start. And that, I think, as a society, is how we perceive prevention. 
But I want to share with you a definition of prevention that I really, that guides my work and the way I think about it for not only the work I do, but in my life with my children and, and how I um, interact with them about this. So the definition of prevention that comes from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, is that prevention is a proactive process that empowers individuals and systems to meet the challenges of life events and transitions by creating and reinforcing conditions that promote healthy behaviors and lifestyles. And I love this definition for many reasons. So one, it actually doesn't say anything about substance use. Two, it doesn't say anything about stopping bad things from starting. It's really more about this proactive process. So I wanna break it down a little bit for you because again, I think there are things about this that as we're thinking about how we talk to our kids and how we think about children in our life, how this manifests. So prevention is a proactive process. This can be really hard, especially when we think about substance use, because so many times I hear parents say, well, my kid's a good kid. My kid wouldn't do that. And I always tell parents, no, you have to divorce thinking about your child as a good kid that from they will never be curious. They'll never experiment. They'll never have a friend who you know has influence over them. They're, they're different things. Just because you're a good kid doesn't mean that they won't be exposed in some way. So if we go through that thought process of if I, if I don't say anything and it doesn't exist, then it won't happen is really problematic, which is why we have to be proactive. So it's, it's this proactive process. It's not just hang tight and hope for the best, you know, it's let's move forward with this. And that it, it not only empowers individuals, but also systems. We need to think about ourselves sort of in our larger systems that we live and how do other systems, right? The state that you live in, the schools and everything, how do those all work together with what you're doing to meet the challenges of life events and transitions. So transitions are one of the, are throughout the life course from birth to death, transitions are sort of considered the higher risk periods. And you can think of transitions in anything where you're doing one thing and moving to the next. So if you move, if you go from elementary to middle school or middle school to high school, things that are natural in our lives and in the life course, um, they will, they sort of by nature are higher risk. So for teens, it's those things, it's getting a license, it's moving out of the home. Uh, for adults, it can be marriage, which, which is exciting and yet it's a transition, stressful. It could be divorce, it could be starting a new job. Um, anything that is different can be very stressful and increases risk for substances. So it's challenging life, to meet the challenges of life events and transitions by creating and reinforcing conditions that promote healthy behaviors and lifestyles. Again, this is not about stopping bad things from happening, but it's promoting positive and pro-social things. So generally, I wanted to share some of the goals of substance misuse prevention from that organization that I just talked about. So generally, we want the goals are for alcohol use only for those of legal age and only when the risk of adverse consequences isn't minimal. And I put marijuana here because that applies to states where marijuana is legal. So that's what the goal would be. So legal and low risk. For that prescription drugs and household products are used only as intended. And um, I will also say that things like aerosols or household products that young people use to get high are usually of the first things, if, they're, if they are using something to get, to get high, those will be the first products that they use because of access. So access is one of the most, is one of the biggest risk factors, which is why all of the information about uh, prescription drugs is lock your cabinet, don't get them out of your house as soon as you don't need them. It's harder with household products, but because you might not even think about, oh, I have nail polish remover, but that can be used for people to get high. So, um, and then finally that tobacco products and illegal drugs are not used at all. So how do we accomplish this? And when I ask people this, the first thing I hear is 
we need to tell young people that this is bad for them. We need to tell them about the harms associated with this. And the truth is, knowing is not enough. How many people nowadays, even adults whose brains are fully developed, know that smoking isn't good for them, and yet they continue to do it, in part because of addiction, but they know it's not good for them. And people still, and young people, they start all the time. We still see it. We're seeing a major problem with vaping. The FDA just talked about how vaping is an epidemic. So we know it's not good for us, and yet young people and adults do things. How many adults know that eating re like you know large amounts of fast food isn't good for them? And yet there's a benefit, right? Tastes good, feels good. They still do it. So knowing is not enough. Just saying don't do this. The in my generation growing up, the just say no era, which was problematic for so many reasons, but it's not enough because they don't know what do you, how do you say no? What do you say no to? It's not just knowing. And the last piece on this is I just wanted to share how I think about young people and even ourselves, but we are people and teens, young people, are individuals at the bottom and we are nested within our larger system. So as that definition of prevention is around systems. So we are nested within our friends and family and social networks, including online social networks, which is a whole nother story. We are nested within our organizations. There's schools, any religious organization, clubs, sports. They're nested within communities. So what community do you live in? What are the relationships to organizations in the community? And finally, our laws. So living in Massachusetts, it is now legal to use recreational marijuana, which is a major problem in my opinion around youth initiation. So the, all of these things we are living within and if we only focus on one thing, if we only focus on the young person and we're not thinking about the larger systems that they're living in, we're missing opportunities and we really need to be thinking about that. I'm gonna go over, I'm gonna go over that slide because um, just for the, in, in the interest of time. Okay, so there are lots of ways that we can think about how to work with teens. And we can think about it in all those different levels that I just talked about. We can work with the teens themselves or young people themselves, parents, family, um, extended family, schools, principals, towns, etc. But I'm here today to talk about parents and family. So what do we know is effective in among family and family relationships? So we know that when parents are involved, when, fit, when there's strong family bonds, that's one of the most important things. What doesn't work is, I'll tell you about some of the things that we know doesn't work or don't work. So authoritarian parenting. Authoritarian parenting is when, so there are these four sort of classic parenting styles. And on the left, you'll see a the level of warmth and sensitivity. And on the top, you'll see expectations and control. So when on the bottom left, when we see there are very high expectations and control, but there's low warmth and sensitivity. So this disciplinarian, that parenting style tends to have the worst outcomes with kids in terms of substance use and other risk. They, will be re they tend to be rebellious, they don't listen. Um, and on the right, neglectful, so low warmth and low control and expectations is not good. Um, and permissive, so having really a lot of warmth and sensitivity, but not a lot of structure is also not great for teens. Authoritarian is the worst, but authoritative where you have structure, you have expectations, you say, this is what I expect of you. This is the structure that we have but also providing a lot of warmth and sensitivity in the family is the best type of parenting style. And it, it can be hard sometimes amidst busy lives and you know attitudes and talking back and everything, but that tends to be the best type of parenting. What also doesn't work is when parents are permissive with their kids. So if we think about alcohol, for example, generally what the level that parents tell their kids of their what they're allowed to do the kids will do so when parents say 
I don't, I expect that you won't use substances. I don't want you going to parties where there are going to be, um, where there's going to be alcohol or other drugs. If something happens, I expect you to call me and you are able to work those expectations in again, in the context of warmth, because it's, I care about you. That's really effective. When parents say it's okay that you drink, as long as there's a parent there, that's what they will likely do because you're giving that expectation and permission in my town where I live in, in right outside of Boston, we have a huge problem where parents will drop their kids off in what we call the woods and kids on Friday and Saturday night are drinking there. There's lots of sex going on. There's violence and the police haven't been involved for lots of different reasons, but parents are literally dropping their kids off. So that's, um, it's really important that whatever you say to your kids, that's sort of the ceiling that they'll see themselves with. So if you say, it's okay that you're drinking as long as you're doing it at home with me, that's what they'll do. So when, when we have higher expectations, generally parents, uh, kids will conform to those. Also, mon so what does work? Monitoring. When parents know where their kids are, it's very effective, it's very helpful. And open communication. This is one of the most important pieces of information is open communication. So in my last minute, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some strategies about, um, about open communication. So how do you have open communication? So first of all, when, you know, again, I have a 10 year old, so he's like a tween starting to get into that age range. And you say, and even my seven year old, how was your day? Good. Right, so I'm using an open-ended question. An open-ended question is a question that doesn't have a yes or no answer. And yet, oftentimes we'll get good, fine, okay, right? So how do we, how do we communicate? Ask open-ended questions. Follow up on one word answers. Oh, it, it was good, so tell me a little bit more about it. Or what happened in this class today? Or tell me about your baseball game or whatever it is. Oh, I know you were having a problem with so-and-so at school. Tell me more about that. So really using those um, strategies. And um, also when we ask questions, don't just sort of do it gratuitously. We need to be able to be very, very present and in the moment. So many times, and I find myself doing this too and I have to check myself. My son will be asking me something and I'm like, oh wait, hold on, I just need to check something or I just need to send a text or because we're in this world of multitasking and digital, everything is right at our fingertips. But it is so important that we say, you know what, we're having a conversation, I'm gonna put this down right now and I'm gonna pay attention to you. So that was just in the introduction, the best way that we can actually be effective is sitting down and listening. Also in terms of substances, so um, you wanna be able to be aware of, have, of opportunities to have a conversation. So again, the parents will say to me, I know I should, but I don't know when, I don't know how. Anytime there's an opportunity, is there a celebrity that in the news that they know of, you know, a young celebrity? It happens all the time, unfortunately. But is there a celebrity that they, um, that they know that you can start talking to them about what happened? Or has something happened in the town? And if your child asks a question that might be related, try to be able to sit down at that moment and answer the question. And you want to become knowledgeable about alcohol and drugs. It's really hard when parents feel like, I don't know enough. There are so many resources available for parents and for kids and teens in particular, where you can even sit down together and figure stuff out. Um, so, you know, and for example, around opioids, prescription drugs, there's so much out there right now. But when your child, if your child comes to you, you want, want to be able to give them the right information. So those are just some quick strategies and tips. Um, I'm going to end here and want to be able to answer any questions that you might have. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Skier. So thank you so much. So I want to remind you about your cards. If you have a question, jot it down on your cards, and we will, um, I will be able to ask Dr. Skier so she can hear. I'm sure if we just shouted them out, she wouldn't even be able to hear us. So hold up your hand, and we'll come around and collect the cards from you. Um, in the meantime, I'll, I'll start off the questions. Um, 
so Margie, hopefully you can hear us fine. Talk a little bit about uh, how, one question I hear a lot is how do you, how do you talk to your kids or what do you tell your kids, what do you think is the best thing to tell your kids when they ask you about your substance abuse? Um, I know, um, so, you know, my kids, I grew up, I grew up in, the, in the time when drinking age was 18. I was still in high school and I was legal, uh, could drink legally. So um, I was actively drinking when my, my kids are, you know, not able to do that. So how do you respond to that, Dr. Skier? Yeah, so that's a question I get all the time, such an important question. And the prevailing thought right now is that you should be honest with your kids, but not sort of glamorize it. So, you know, if you spent a lot of time drinking or using marijuana or anything else in high school or college, it shouldn't be, let me regale you with the excitement of my life back then. It should be, yes, I did it, um, but let me tell you why you know, some of the things that happened as a result, so using it as a teaching opportunity, or this is why I wish I hadn't, and this is why I don't want you to. So the thing about legal age is that people will ask me all the time too, should I, is it okay for me to drink at dinner or drink in front of my kids? And, you know, it is okay to do that. If you're, as long as you're doing it responsibly, as long as you're of legal age, and as long as you're modeling good behavior, so our laws will change. And so again, when I was in, you know, even recently using marijuana was not legal, but now it will be. So people for in Massachusetts, and again, we're gonna see a wave across the country. So what happens, are parents allowed to use marijuana in front of their kids? Um, I mean, I'd, I'd probably say, you know, it should be limited, but it should also be a conversation. So do I sit down occasionally and have a glass of wine with dinner? Yes. And then I talk to my kids about that, that I am of legal age, my brain is developed, I'm allowed to, and I don't, I'm not irresponsible with it. So that's sort of the main thing. So be able to say, yes, I did, or no, I didn't, uh, why I did, why I didn't, but not to glamorize it. And that's the important thing. Um, but you don't want your kid to find out that you lied to them, and because that will be, I think, the biggest breach. So being honest but minimal is really important. But the other thing about like drinking or um, doing other things that are legal in front of kids is really about modeling good behavior. So well, we know that when parents get drunk in front of their kids, so if a, if a child has seen their parent get drunk one time, one time, they are five times more likely to binge drink, which is drinking five or more drinks in a, sing in a two hour period in high school. So do not get drunk in front of your child and model good behavior. So they, it's amazing. You know, if you want to know what you look like and sound like, listen to your kids, right? It was, that was such a big learning experience for me becoming a parent because you, you start hearing yourself in them and they see those same behaviors. So everything that we do when it comes to, you know, how we act as adults, again, digital, our, our digital lives, how they see us interacting with our phones, how they see us interacting with every food, substances, that's what we're modeling for them. So, um, and again, like I said, when parents are saying like, oh, I just, I need to relax, sit down at the end of the day and have a drink. When you say that, and people will say it very innocently, right? But it's modeling that, that alcohol is used as a way to relax, not, no, this is, I'm gonna have this with dinner, I'm gonna have just a glass of wine or whatever. But it's, mod it's really about modeling the behavior and being honest to an extent. Other, we have lots of questions for you, Margie, so hang in there. We're going to fire some more at you. Here's one uh, from one of our audience members today. What are the common missed red flags that we should be looking out for? What, how, what advice can you give us on what to be looking out for with our kids when it comes to substance abuse? So. I think, you know, there are some obvious red flags, right, um, where, you know, uh, some, I mean, it's hard because sometimes it's just like transition from being, you know, younger to, to adolescent and brain development where your friends will change and whatnot, but looking for patterns. So if all of a sudden friends are changing, that's, that's 
you know, something you want to pay attention to. If clothes are changing, if discuss, you know, discussions are changing, um, that's something you want to really pay attention to. Um, I don't know how many sort of non-obvious red flags there are, but academics, when academics start changing, it could be because they're just getting very hard, but it might also be related to um, substance use or other risk stuff that's going on. But there are some, you know, it, it's becoming harder, like back, you know, up until even recently, you might be able to figure out your kid is smoking pot because they smell, right? But we have all of these ways of using marijuana covertly now, edibles um, that teens are getting their hands on, even in states that aren't legal, vaping, which is another huge one. So the hardest thing, I think the red flags that are really hard to see are when there's paraphernalia that we don't actually know is paraphernalia. So for example, right now there are um, these, the vaping devices that are called jewels. Many of you may have heard about it and they look like um, USB drives. So I don't have one with me, but I can show you a USB drive that this is basic. So this is my USB drive. And this is essentially what a jeweling device looks like. And it even has this piece that you can, that it charges into a computer. So teachers can't even tell what that is. But there are um, programs, there's one called Hidden in Plain Sight, for example, about all the things that could be you, you know, devices for marijuana. There are ways that teens use alcohol that we would never know about. Like they infuse gummy bears. They, um, it's a little bit less common, but they'll soak tampons because again, you won't smell like alcohol. So it's really hard when you don't know what you're looking for. And I think that's my biggest concern when things are really covert. And even if you're really hyper vigilant and on the lookout, you might not realize it. So to combat that is to really try to have those open and honest conversations. So to be able to say, look, I know, you know, young people experiment, or I know that some people your age might be doing this, but I want us to be able to talk about this. I want you to have, if you have any questions, let's talk about it. So that hopefully um, you'd be able to get some of the information without sort of discovering it on your own. Great. Um, so here's another question from an audience member, uh, Margie. How, can you speak specifically to how family meals help? And you know, some of the things specifically that are helpful to having a family meal together? Absolutely. So that's actually one of my big lines of work is promoting family meals. And I eat meals with my kids every night. Um, my husband and I, we sit down and even like last night when my son was at baseball practice, I ate with my daughter, he came home. Even though I was done eating, I sat with him while he was eating. So it doesn't have to be sort of a formal sit down thing. It could be if your child is eating, you can be sitting with them um, even, you know, even if it's only a few minutes. So the way that they help is, first of all, it allows communication. So we know when families sit down together in whatever permutation that is, one parent one, or guardian, one child, or a whole group of people, if there are distractions going on, it's not effective, right? So the idea is it's ha what's happening at the meal, but not the meal itself that is protective over time. So if you're sitting on your phone or if the television's on and everyone's watching it, that's nice, it's, it's lovely that you're all sitting together, but it's missing the opportunity for communication. So that's where, you know, any meal's important. Dinners are great because you can sort of talk about the events of the day. What happened? Tell me about this. It's a check-in time. It's also a time where par if, if it's done consistently, par without kids even sort of realizing it, it's a time that it, the parents are saying to them, this time is important. It's important that I have consistent time with you and I am taking a time out and making sure that we are sitting together and being able to talk. It's time too where you can follow up about things, um, especially if you're having consistent meals. And it's a time where you can sort of check in on patterns. So again, like I said, if you, want, if you start seeing changes in friends or in clothes or stuff like that, you, if you're seeing your kids sort of every day and really focusing on them, 
it's different. You're running to school, they're running here, there, you know, it's hard to sort of give that focused time, but meals allow that time to really sort of delve and try to relax. It's hard if they're not relaxing, if everybody's sort of tense or if the family um, environment is kind of contentious, that can be made hard, but it's really a time where you can sort of stop and press pause and you have, you know, you have to eat. So it's a, just sort of a natural time where you can be together. If you can eat meals together, because it's not possible all the time for everybody, it's not about the meal again. It's about, can you find a half an hour, 10 minutes, whatever it is, each day or five days a week in the car, walking somewhere, um, after, you know, before bedtime, uh, like during, you know, if reading or TV or whatever it is, can you find that little bit of time? But meals just, again, provide that natural time for that to happen. So we have several questions that are, are sort of similar. They're talking about the, uh, how, how, talking about what are the important open-ended questions that you can use to start these conversations? And then uh, what are the things that are really sp- that you know work when it comes to uh, setting expectations or the things that are we know will work when it comes to uh, helping to guide our kids, constructive actions we can take uh, when we're talking with our kids and that type of thing? Yeah, so the first thing is that we want to be developmentally appropriate, right? So I started talking to my son about um, addiction when he was four. And I didn't use the word addiction. I didn't talk about it like that. But I started, he started asking me questions where we we lived in the city at the time. And he started asking me about why so many people smoked when he knew we had told him it's not good for you. And so this was, and his great grandmother smoked at the time too. So, you know, why does she do it? Why do all these people do it? And so I used that question as an opportunity to start talking about what, you know, how our, how, uh, nicotine is a is a drug, is a substance, and it goes into our body and it makes our brain sort of want it all the time, right? So you starting conversations in developmentally appropriate ways, and I didn't use the word addiction until much, much later. But by then, we had talked about it so many times. Now, I know I'm cheating because this is my area, right? <laughs> so um, it's much easier for me to do that. But I started early in a way when something made sense. Um, to start these conversations, you know, even to be able to say, you know what, I want to sit down with you and just ask you some questions, or I just want to be able to talk to you. And even to say, I was wondering if you had any questions for me. I know, like, I'm sure you, you know, you know about alcohol, marijuana, but um, I'm wondering if you have questions for me, or are there things that you're seeing that you don't know about? And it's, that's a really good way to sort of open the conversation. It can be very awkward for parents, I know, because they're like, "Mm, it's just so weird, it's awkward, I don't know sort of how to do this. But sometimes you just need to sit down and say, you know what, I wanna have a conversation with you about this. Um, The things to say are what your expectations are. And you can say, look, I know, you know, maybe in the town, like in my town, a lot of kids in the high school are going and drinking at at this place, you know, but my expectation will be that they don't. So to say, I expect you not to use alcohol. I expect you not to smoke. I expect you not to use marijuana until you are of age to do it. Um, However, it's a balance because if you have a teenager and they are ever in a compromised situation, you want them to be able to call you or rely on you if they are in a place where somebody drove and they're drinking or if your child is drinking. So you want to, again, the more you have these kind of conversations, the better it is because then you can say, these are my expectations. However, if my number one priority is your safety. So if you're ever in a situation where, you know, something does happen, I want you to be able to tell, call me and I will get you and no questions asked and we will talk about it because I think it's important. But Um, your safety is really important. So it is a delicate balance of, I don't expect you to do this. This is why, right? 
when we give explanations, when we're able to sit down and look at resources, so for example, the National Institute on Drug Abuse has a whole website called NIDA, which is stands for National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA for Teens. And it has every single substance for the most part, um, every drug, and the, it was designed to for teens to understand it. And so as a parent, you can say, these are my expectations, but let's talk about why these are my expectations. And let's look at this together and understand it, right? And so the other thing is, you know, the importance of doing it frequently and not just one time. If you think about a difficult concept, because to us, when we say, oh, teens just shouldn't use alcohol or drugs or opioids or whatever, it's sort of cut and dry for us. But it's not just, it's not that simple for them. So if you think about like, if we were teaching our teens how to drive cars, right? We not only do a whole, you know, lots of sessions on the mechanics of the car and what the rules of the road are and all of these things, but we do, we do supervised driving. We, you know, do it with them for a long time. It's sort of similar. I mean, we wouldn't say have a one time conversation with your kid about, well, check your rearview mirror and, you know, this is the gas pedal. Um, in the same way, this is actually a skill that we need to provide them. There are also tons of resources about how to have these conversations. So there's a, um, a website called Talk They Listen, which is from the um, partnership for drugfree.org. And they have whole, um, whole websites sort of dedicated to types of conversations that you can have, the words you can use. And it's developmentally about, you know, this is what you should talk about with elementary school students or this age group or whatever. And so there are lots of ways that you can actually develop your skills to help them develop their skills. Because refusal skills, it's very hard for kids to say no. But if we as parents say, this is what you can say, oh my God, I can't do that because my mom will kill me, right? That's actually the like number one reason people don't use, teens don't use substances because my parents will like, they'll have my head. Um, so the more we can do to give them those skills, the better off they're gonna be. Yeah, we sometimes, you know, that when they push back, it feels like they're not ever listening or that what we say doesn't matter, but uh, it does matter. They, they'd want to know that you disapprove, so that's a good thing. So uh, one quick announcement for you that we will be sharing all the information from Dr. Sears, Skier's slides today about what does and doesn't work. So everyone who registered uh, will get that information summarized in a post email. So uh, not, to, not to worry if your note-taking skills are, are lacking this morning, it's early. Um, so we'll keep, we'll go with another question here, Are we good? Um, a couple of these, these questions aren't totally related, but I think I'm gonna fire them at you at the same time. Uh, I find this interesting. Uh, what do you think about video game addiction and, and <laughs> does that lead to other addictions? And also, what about the substance abuse conversation? Is it different for boys versus girls? What are your thoughts on that? So, so that's a really great question. So. To address the video game addiction, um, that's not exactly my area, so I can't speak to it so much, but we we have seen sort of a big uptick in video or did whatever it is, even if it's not video game, but like the digital, um, you know, the, the extent to which young people are sort of obsessed with their digital, with their phone, with games, with social media. Um, again, I'll, I'll sort of point to the pathways, right? So if young people are spending a ton of time playing video games, what are they not doing? And so we're, that's where you're gonna start seeing those pathways in the brain become more solidified. So if they're engaging in video games, they're gonna be much, like, much more likely in adulthood to be spending a lot of time in video games. We also see a lot of sort of the, um, the social network stuff on video games where people are playing with other people sort of around the world and it feels it's sort of this false sense of community but it's very it is still isolating so i think having limitations on screen time video game time um, phone time can be really helpful because again if they're so obsessed and they're spending a lot of time doing that what are the other things they aren't doing? 
So even if it's going outside to play, if it's going to meet a friend at a movie, you know, whatever it is, but I think we need to encourage social time as well as non-screen time because of what it means sort of in the long term for their brains. I don't, I don't feel like I can speak to sort of what it means for substances, you know, with teens who are engaging in video games a lot. Um, but I would definitely say like as much as we can sort of limit it, it's going to be better for them. With respect to conversations around um, substances for boys and girls and differences, it's an important question because the reason that young people, young males and young females use substances are actually different. And so if we know more about why they're using, we can gear the conversations a little bit better. So for example, boys are more likely to use substances because it's fun, because it's a sensation seeking, it's risk taking, it's fitting in. Whereas for girls, they tend to use it more around like romantic or sexual relationships. It's what a big risk factor, particularly if you have a teenage girl who's in a relationship with an older boy. Um, alcohol is often introduced, even if they're, you know, 15 and 17 or, you know, just a little bit older. We see that a lot. So having conversations about sort of romantic relationships, they will also tend to use it, like I said, sort of for weight loss or self image purposes. If they don't feel good about themselves, that's when they'll turn to it. So knowing your kid. And so the, the other piece of family meals, and again, it's not just the meal, it's the sort of the daily interaction is knowing them really well. So if you know your child well, and you know what the things that are hard for them. So how nervous are they around friends? How nervous are they around, you know, boyfriends or girlfriends? Um, how much does, you know, the stuff that they do, how risky is it in terms of sensation seeking? Then you can start pairing the conversations a little bit more and help them figure out ways to meet those needs without substances. So, you know, it could be sort of, Therapy might be a way to address it, but there might be other ways that, you know, for boys, for sensation seeking, um, that you can get them involved in something that would be really fun and exciting for them that can help prevent substances. But it's really sort of knowing why they use it, but knowing your kid most importantly is what's going to be most helpful. Dr. Skeeter, that's all the time we have for questions. Thank you so much for joining us today and taking so much time uh, out of your busy schedule to answer our questions. And for those of you uh, whose questions we didn't get to, we will zap those to her in an email and we'll uh, summarize those in our post uh, email back to you guys today. Does that work for you guys? Okay. So Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was great. Thank you so much. A round of applause. Hopefully she can hear our, our loud applause all the way there. Such great questions. Thanks, you guys. Um, so next, uh, our next speaker is Special Agent. Yes, Special Agent Heather Ryan. For 14 years, Heather Ryan was a special agent with the Naval Criminal Investigative Service, NCIS, just like on TV. During that time, she served in five different duty stations and traveled all around the world investigating felonies ranging from sexual assault and narcotics to homicide and espionage. As an interrogator and hostage negotiator, Heather learned firsthand how the criminal mind operates and how the bad guys choose their victims. After years as a field agent, Heather became a supervisory special agent, managing a team of agents in a 10-state area of responsibility. After turning in her badge and her gun, Heather founded Safe in the City. Now, instead of only reacting to crime, she has the chance to help prevent her audience members from becoming statistics. Her message is one of empowerment rather than fear, and our audience today will leave understanding uh, and believing they have the power to keep themselves and those they care about safe. Heather has a, a BS in criminal justice and psychology and an MS in criminology, and please everyone help me welcome Heather up to the stage. Thank you. So cute. I didn't used to get to wear this at my old job. See, there's no belt, so I like to wear pants that I don't need to hold a gun anymore. 
<laughs> Thank you for having me again in Wisconsin. You, I love coming up here, and I suggest to my husband, I'm like, I don't know, I think they like me in Madison, maybe we should look at moving. <laughs> He's like, do you know how cold it is there? <laughs> okay, never mind. Um, I can't really, okay, so we could pull up the slide. Perfect, and then one more. Perfect. So I like to start out all of these um, talks by acknowledging the elephant in the room. Like I know I look like a second grade teacher. <laughs> and I found that when I don't address the fact they look like a second grade teacher, I see people in the audience going like, huh? And they're talking to their neighbor like, really? Yes, I do. And um, initially when I started this job, I really bucked against that because I wanted to be one of the guys, right? I wanted to run as fast as they did and shoot as well as they did. And it wasn't until I got really comfortable with who I am to when I got comfortable doing my job, right? So how many of you have heard of NCIS? The TV show? I hear Mark Harmon's very nice. Um, so NCIS stands for Naval Criminal Investigative Service. And if we could just do one more. Um, so I included these pictures. I didn't used to also. I've, I've learned a lot of things, but I didn't include them because it never occurred to me that anyone would think that I actually wasn't an agent with NCS until I went to a big conference and they were like, there was somebody, another speaker, and I told him what I was gonna talk about and he looked at me and kind of rolled his eyes like, oh, it's like I gotta put pictures in here. However, these are the only two pictures that exist with me with any NCIS stuff on. It never occurred to me to take a picture of myself while doing my job. Um, my husband was an agent also, and we have hundreds of pictures of him holding guns and doing crime scenes. Like, did you work like ever? Anyways, so that, those are my pictures. Um, NCIS stands for Naval Criminal Investigative Service. Um, NCIS agents are civilian. Uh, they investigate felonies that um, can be punishable by a year or more in prison. So things like homicide, sexual assault, large-scale narcotics, um, child abuse, domestic violence. Those are what we call our general crimes. Um, and then we also investigate uh, counterintelligence, counterespionage. So other countries trying to steal our military technology generally. Terrorism, um, bad guys trying to uh, hit one of our installations or our um, boats or whatever, whatever we have out there. And then we have a big fraud department, right? So we could talk about that for an hour, but lots of really interesting things that NCIS agents get to do right away. We are very small. There's like 1,200 agents for the whole world. And usually people say, well, what's the difference between NCIS and the FBI? And I start with, um, they have 10,000 agents and we have 1,200, so there's that. Um, FBI is primarily stateside and we are um, worldwide. But what we investigate are those felonies that are even either committed by or against uh, people in the Department of the Navy. So that's Navy and Marine Corps. Uh, and then if you think about overseas things like counter espionage and things, those are, I mentioned, people trying to steal our military technology or terrorists trying to hurt the military in some form or fashion. Also on military bases, NCIS has pro what's called primary jurisdiction on those Navy and Marine Corps bases. So if you think of a base has 100,000 people on it, say like I was in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina for a while, local uh, police can't come on base and run investigations. So that is what FBI, or excuse me, <laughs> That's what NCIS is there for. So while I worked for NCIS, I started, um, now I look like a second grade teacher, but back in the day, I looked like a 22 year old college student. So I got to work um, undercover narcotics a lot initially. So at the time, um, and I started in Chicago, and at the time raves were really big, if you guys remember, um, late 90s, early 2000s. Anyway, so I got to go buy drugs and get paid for it at night, which was like the most amazing job a 26 year old can have. So I did that, that worked out well. I got transferred a couple of times. I went and worked counter espionage for about four years. Uh, then I went into our general crime. So I worked a lot of family and sexual violence. Along the way, um, I learned my skills. And so one of them, I became an interrogator. We're all interrogators, but we have special people who are good at general things, and like I look like a second grade teacher, looking like this actually helps when you're talking to a bad guy, right? They, they don't think you're a threat, and then when you become a threat, they're all off, off shaking. It works out well. So I also became a hostage negotiator, and then eventually I, um, I gave in and became a supervisory special agent. I worked in our Chicago office where we have an area of responsibility of 10 states surrounding Illinois, um, and I had an amazing group of guys that worked for me. But along the way, I married another agent. 
When I speak at universities, I like to tell people who want to get in this field, because there's so many crime shows now, right? Just so you know, no one will marry you except another agent. So we have to marry each other. So, so I married my husband. We had two kiddos along the way, and I never saw them, ever. Um, his job, he worked terrorism and, and fraud, and that's more of a, sounds strange, more of a nine to five. I like to say, <laughs> I like to say um, criminals, do, criminals are incredibly rude, so they commit crimes at like midnight and Christmas and birthdays, and, and I wasn't seeing my kids. So out of the blue, we felt like at the time my husband was recruited to work in St. Louis, we decided to take this huge leap of faith. Um, he took the job in St. Louis, and I left without having any idea what I was going to do. It turns out there aren't a lot of people hiring hostage negotiators, so that was a problem. Um, and then somebody, one day somebody asked me to come speak, and they said, how much do you get paid? And I was like, people pay people to do that? Like to, I've been doing it ever since. So now I get to hopefully take some of those things I learned from the bad guys and teach it to you. This isn't stuff I learned from a class or a book or some statistics. It's what I learned from sitting and interrogating the stinky bad guys. So we can go. All right. So today we're going to talk about cyber uh, safety and then physical safety. This is a lot of information. It's going to get shotgunned at you. I acknowledge that. So then after we talk for about 20 minutes, think about any questions that you have while I'm throwing it all at you, and we will slow down and go back to whatever questions you might have. All right, so first the cyber safety. So keeping our kids safe online, um, you can go to the next one, it is much easier to put our heads in the sand, right? It's just much easier for us to say, I don't understand it, social media, kids these days, I just, I quit, right? But we. We cannot, that is not, we cannot do that one. So what we have to do is acknowledge that all of our kids, whether they're our kids, um, kids that we know in the neighborhood, our grandkids, our, our nieces, our nephews, we all have children in our lives and every single one of those children will be online, right? We acknowledge that and move forward. So, okay, we know this is gonna happen. How can we keep them safe while they're doing it? Okay, all right, so one, who are those bad guys? And just like any bad guys, we have this thought often that they're this really creepy, gross guy that lives in their mom's basement. Now, sometimes they are, right? But lots of times they look just like these guys, right? They're from every race, every age. Uh, the first one's from Glee. He had little tons of people that he met online, was convicted of child pornography. Um, Jared Subway was really disappointing for those of us from Indiana. He really let us down. But he had all kinds of child pornography. And the last guy was um, from a thing called Dream Board, which is um, a, an exchange of child pornography, huge ring that was on the internet. And all three of these guys are looking for our children, right, to exploit. Here's the next one. All right, so what is also really important is to remember those bad guys, this isn't like a nine to five job for them. And unlike us, they do this 24 seven, right? So we might devote uh, during the week, maybe 30 minutes telling our kids like, quit it, knock it off, don't do it. Remember that while we're spending those 30 minutes, this, these guys' lives revolve around finding our children online. And if we know that, if we know that their lives revolve on it, then we also need to give it a little bit more time. I include this picture just as an example. When we would do search warrants or arrest warrants, this is often what we would see. These guys sit at their computers and they don't leave, like ever. They don't leave to eat, they don't leave to go to the bathroom, nothing. This is how obsessed they are. So I feel like hopefully that gives us a good explanation of why we need to learn, okay? So those are the bad guys, which is all different people. So who are the victims? Exactly the same, right? This isn't an inner city problem, it's not a rural problem, it's not a suburban problem. It's worldwide, right? There's no specific racial group that, that doesn't have this issue. It's all of our kids, right? So keeping that in mind, we all need to learn how to combat it. Okay, next. All right, so this is how the bad guys think initially. You may have all heard of the term grooming. I don't think that's a great term. Um, law enforcement uses it all the time, but that's a pro-social word, right? Like apes groom each other, and that's a good thing. Law enforcement uses this term and it kind of dulls it down. I think we should maybe use the term manipulation process because that's exactly what it is, right? So the bad guys go to the website. What website do they go to? 
kid websites, right? So when we hear people talk about um, adult dating sites and things, I mean, yeah, those are bad, but if we slow down and think about it, if you were a bad guy, where would you go to find children? Where children hang out, right? It only makes sense. So they go to websites frequented by children. Then they start looking around, looking around. Now this takes them up not long at all because they're looking for people, kids who are saying things like, ooh, I hate school, I hate my mom, I hate my dad, right? All complaining about adults. And the very first thing they do is say, yeah, those guys are horrible. Teachers are horrible. Moms don't understand, right? And they're, they're empathizing with them, making it's like, yeah, we're in this fight together, right? And then somewhere along the line, they figure out what different kids respond to. So a lot of girls especially respond to, you are beautiful. Oh my gosh, you're a model. Have you ever, you know, all of these things puffing these kids up, right? And then eventually these kids think there's a relationship. And I say eventually, but sometimes it's like two hours, right? And sometimes it's two days. And to us, we're like, you, you talk to somebody for two days. You don't, are you kidding? This isn't a relationship. But the doctor is talking about their brains, right? They don't think the way we do. They think this, I'm in a real relationship, right? And so once they have them there, that's when they start making the request, right? Oh, I do, I do love you. You know, if we love each other, we should send each other pictures. And they say, I don't know, I thought that I wasn't supposed to. And the bad guy's like, of course you, it's all right, I love you. So they do. And we go back to, why? Like, are you, you've been taught since kindergarten, right? These kids have grown up with the internet like we have not. But they do it because they're brains, right? We're, she stole my thunder a little bit, we're gonna talk about that. But, um, right, so they, they do this. Um, and then, once they have one, let's just give an example. So the bad guy gets one inappropriate picture from a girl, right? Well now, and, and then she's like, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have done that, right? I shouldn't have done that. Too late, right? Because now the bad guy says, oh, sorry, but I have this picture and you can either send me more or I'm gonna send it to your mom and your grandma and your school and I'm gonna put it all over the place. And now the kid's like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna get in so much trouble. And then, and then they start sending more and you can see how that vicious cycle just continues, right? Till eventually, if we talk way down the line, many of these bad guys, their ultimate goal is to meet the child in person. And we always say the same thing. You've been taught not to meet people online. That's not how they think, right? That's not how they think. And these bad guys, they don't have to break in your home to find these guys, kids, right? The kids walk out on their own. They, they go out and there's no bad guy climbing in the window, right? The, our kids leave, right? So that's what we need to understand about how this crazy process works. I mean, she stole that, but <laughs> it's rain. It's <laughs> so, they're, yeah, they're, so their, their prefrontal cortex is not established like ours is, right? Um, it, they make decisions that we all are like, are you kidding me right now? I have two children, and we were talking earlier, like terrorists are easier than my nine-year-old and 11-year-old. Like, why? I told you, right? Um, they just don't think the way we do. So we need to remember that when we're figuring out like, why can't they regulate uh, their emotions? Why do they do things over and over we've told them not to do? Okay. All right, so let's bring it back to how do we understand? Because none of this is meant to scare you so much. You're like, oh, I'm gonna put my child in a bubble. It's not, we can't, right? So, so this is just meant to give you some information, what you can do to like start the process in your home to keep your kids safe. So when we're talking about apps, there, there's generally seven types of apps. We talk all day about specific ones, but we're not gonna do that today. But just to understand, so we have texting apps. It's not just your phone, right? There are different apps kids use to text back and forth. Um, there's the photo and video apps where you can send stuff back and forth. Microblogging is kind of like, if you think of mom blogs, it's like kid blogs kind of, but really short short little um, conversations. Live stream, incredibly dangerous, right? Because you can't regulate that, right? You can't check to see what happened on that live stream if it wasn't recorded. So bad guys love that stuff. Um, secret and self-destruct apps. Um, I, I'll show you a couple examples, but on phones, there are all kinds of apps that people can use to put, so if you picture it, there's like a good app, but really inside of that app is a bad one. We'll talk about that for a second. Um, there's dating and there's gaming. And now gaming is really a great place for bad guys. And my son would, would play games until his eyeballs fell out if I let him, right? But we go back to, if I was a bad guy, where would I go? 
we're gonna go where kids hang out. So kids hang out at Minecraft, right? Kids hang out all the places where they play games. And these bad guys don't come on and say like, hey, I'm a 50 year old dude living in my mom's basement. No, they, they come on saying things like, I'm a 14 year old girl. And this is why like, an, and then eventually somehow they get all this information from the kid and the kid's like, well, they're my friend. They're 14, they live in Madison, it's fine. Because no guy's gonna get on there and say, I'm a 50 year old weirdo who's living in my mom's basement, right? It's not gonna work, right? All right, so there's all these apps that we're gonna get educated on, right? We're gonna learn about these apps, we're gonna talk about that a little bit. How are we gonna learn about them? When we're on them, there's all these crazy things that kids say that like probably are, you know, my parents in the 80s probably said the same thing, but but we didn't have this stuff written down. We didn't, uh, our, our notes we passed in, in science class didn't get very far, right? So, um, you know, if take a picture of that, but there's all these uh, things that we need to know. GNOC, if you see that on a child's text, get naked on camera. Um, WTTP is what we see a lot. Netflix and chill. So most of us, if we hear our kids, they're gonna go out and they're gonna just, I don't know, Netflix and chill. They, we think, because it's what we do, most of us, you know, we turn on Netflix, like we sit down and you have some popcorn. That's not what they mean, right? Netflix and chill. It's, it's, see you for sex or they're going to have sex or, or whatever, but understand that one especially. Um, <clears throat> and I can go to the next one. For a full list of these kind of stuff, you can go to Urban Dictionary. Um, if any of you guys have heard of that before, Ur I mean, they've got pages full of crazy stuff that kids say that we don't, um, I mean, you know, we could be up here all day talking about those things, but just check out Urban Dictionary and I'll get you some good stuff. Um, so these are just examples of those hiding apps and I left this in here because I, I get the most questions about these. So if you're looking at your child's phone, which you should be, um, if you see multiple calculator apps on there, that's a problem. No child just really wants to do math. I mean, you, I might, you know, you might be a real go-getter math guy, but I'm gonna guess if you have more than one calculator, there's a problem, right? So calculators are often used as hiding apps. When you look at the phone, you're gonna see things that just don't look like other apps. And how they work is, I, I mentioned, think of it like a folder, right? You only see the outside of the folder looks good. And say the folder is locked somehow. And when you unlock it, inside is all the stuff that they don't want you to see, right? So all kinds of hiding apps can be used for that. And as soon as adults get, get onto one, they just develop another. So even telling you today all of them, it will change tomorrow. So these are one of the things that you're gonna have to keep educating yourself, and I'll give you some resources. Learning, learning, learning all the time, okay? All right, so all this crazy stuff happens. Well, what do we do, what do we do? We can't keep them off the internet. We can't say, just, just don't do it. It's not gonna work. Um, so a couple ideas. You wanna set their accounts to private. You wanna turn off location services. And that also means on your phone, your camera has location services. Lots of adults don't know that. And they'll post pictures of their families or whatever on Facebook. They're like, we're so happy. Those pictures that you post on Facebook, if you don't have your location services turned off, and I'm a bad guy, there are apps now, it used to take some skill, but it doesn't anymore, two clicks and they will tell me exactly where you took that picture, right? The latitude and longitude, exactly. In your home, down to like in your living room, right? We don't need bad guys to know that. Turn off location services, even on your camera. So your kid says, it's fine, I just have Instagram. Cool, turn off your location services. Um, and if you don't know how to do that, YouTube has everything you ever want to know. So, you know, get on there for your particular phone. Um, parental controls and um, restricting those information. And then on all of your browsers. So remember, if you are using Google and Chrome and Safari, all of those different things need to have your parental controls on them. And, and I'm talking kind of broad here understanding there are some people in here who have infants and then elementary and middle and high school and college kids. So this is pretty broad that hopefully any of you can use um, with any of the kids in your lives, okay? All right, so we're talking about those. Uh, they do have kid browsers. Now, your child in high school is probably not gonna be interested in using, <laughs> using the kid browser, let's, let's be honest. But your little people might, right? So there's all different kinds of kid browsers. Um, we want you to have a common space for devices, again, 
Try this with your high schooler. Realistically, I'm not sure how well it's going to work out, right? They probably have, to have a phone or, or whatever. But your main computers, and especially with your little people who don't have phones yet, if we start them in this common area, like this is just what our family does, right? Then it's not strange as going forward. Um, and then explore the apps that they use. So we talked about the hiding apps and how you will never be up to date every day on those hiding apps, right? Same with social media. We know several now that have problems and, and we can research that, but the reality is it changes every day. So what we suggest is that you talk to your kids and tell them things like, first do your own research, what I suggest. Do your own research. Common Sense Media is a fantastic place to, to learn about apps and phones and everything. Go there, do some research, right? And then talk to them about, hey, what's going on? All right, so we talked about uh, talks. Set up different accounts for each of your kids, right? And be a good role model with that. <clears throat> Here's some resources. All of these websites are fantastic websites. You can go to get a little more information. Okay, so we're gonna take that to physical safety, all the stuff that we just learned. Great, we're keeping them safe in cyberspace. How are we gonna keep them safe here with us? What we often tell people regarding, if we're talking specifically about sexual abuse, the people who abuse children are the people that they like, love, live with, or live by. We had the idea when I was growing up in the late 70s and 80s, our parents talked about stranger danger and like they had good thoughts, but then it made all of us think there was some creepy guy in a white van down by the river. When the reality is the people who generally abuse our children are the people that we like, love, live with, or live by. And if we think that through, it makes sense. How many, how many of us hang out with strangers, right? Okay. So when we talk to them, what are some tips? What can we do? Okay, one, tell them, teach them anatomically correct body parts. The worst was when I'd be interviewing a child and they have all different names for vaginas and penises. And if they tell their teacher, like um, my, my dad was touching my panda, the teacher's like, oh, that's nice. You have a, no, they don't, they won't know. So you're, if the child's disclosing, they wouldn't even know that was a disclosure, right? So you wanna teach them appropriate names. We wanna talk to them about no one has a right to touch your body, period. Where your bathing suit covers, those are our private parts, and that's how we talk to little people about that. But nobody has a right to touch or look at your private body parts if you don't need help, right? Then we teach them about secrets versus surprises. So, and this can sometimes backfire, but in my house, we've always said we don't keep, we don't keep secrets. And then it was my husband's birthday, and my daughter's like, this is what we got you. And I was like, what are you? We don't keep secrets in our house, mommy. Oh, that's, okay. So, <laughs> Whoops, so surprises, like we can have surprises, surprises are good things, but secrets, no go. We don't keep secrets, right? Okay. All right, so then tricky people versus stranger danger. I mentioned the stranger danger in the 80s. Um, that kind of messed, up, messed us up, but they didn't know, right? So now we talk about tricky people and tell them they don't always look scary, right? Tricky people do tricky things. Um, we want to respect their physical boundaries, and this is any age child that you're around. Do not make them give Uncle Joe a hug if they don't want to give Uncle Joe a hug, right? We taught them to respect their bodies. Now we have to respect their bodies too. Um, and then understand how kids disclose. So understand that you probably, if something happened to a, to a child that you love, you pro even if you're the mom, you probably will not be the first person to learn about it. And this is hard on parents because they think, I, I, I taught them everything and I love them. We have open communication and it is not a parenting fault. This happens all the time. The accidental disclosure happens more often. The telling the friend and somebody else finds out and somebody else tells you much more common than the, than the child coming straight to you. And that is not because of your parenting or, or who you are. All right, so here are some great resources for physical safety, and they do all kinds of stuff from bullying and sexual abuse and, and physical abuse and online cyberbullying kind of stuff. There are so many resources for us. What I'd suggest is you look at a bunch of them, see which one speaks to you, and I keep going back to that one, right? I love Common Sense Media because you can look up movies and, and um, TV shows and apps. It's got tons of information, so I really like that one. But this is a, these are all new. National Center for Missing Exploited Children, I think would be my second one um, for physical issues. All right, last thing is, we have to teach our kids to listen to our intuition. 
or whatever you call it. So whatever's the hair on the back of your neck, whatever it is. I, I mentioned on the last one, um, there's a book by Gavin De Becker, and it's called The Gift of Fear. And the reality is we've all been given this gift. It keeps us safe, right? That's what keeps us safe. But if we start not listening to it, and especially as women, we start thinking like, I don't want to be rude or I'm being judgy or I'm just being too sensitive. No, that's there for a reason and that's to keep us safe. And so my hope is if we start teaching our girls and our boys too, but especially our girls, what that is, what is that, right, that you're feeling? The hope is that when they are adults, this won't be an issue with them stuffing their intuition. All right, and the very last thing is share, right? Anything that you just learned now or that you're gonna learn when we're talking, share it, right? This is not information to be hoarded. I have all kinds of stories that if moms had just talked to each other and not been like ashamed, like I'm a horrible parent and that's why this happened. And no, it's not. None of us, well, most of us did not grow up with the internet, right? We can't, I can't go to my mom and say, hey, what'd you do when I sent inappropriate pictures on Snapchat? Like the, I, this is all new for all of us. So we start, stop judging ourselves and talk to each other. That's the only way all this kind of stuff is gonna keep our kids safe. And that's it. Oh, that's just questions. Oh, it's Sorry, it's not. It's, it's not, not it. it. Because <laughs> now we're gonna fire questions at you. All right. Um, so I have a couple of pre-written questions here so I, we can get the conversation started. But obviously, if you guys have questions, jot them down and send them up. And um, we will we will ask them. So um, before we send our, our daughters or kids to school, should we just buy a mace? No. <laughs> So Is I that guess the best no, it really no, no, do not do no, it's not. So um, people ask me this who have college age kids a lot. Um, I'm sending my daughter to college. Like, should I get her mace? And if I get her mace, what kind? Should it? Should I like blinged out? <clears throat> my <laughs> opinion. <laughs> you seen it? There. Who knew? Um, there are people making a lot of money on your fear because we will spend any amount of money, right, to keep our kids safe. Like, I just want to feel like when my kid goes to college, I've done something to keep them safe. This is not political anyway. I don't lean left, lean right, like maybe towards Canada, but the mace is not, all these things, all these devices that people are marketing to you, if we think about it, we only want to rely on ourselves. So mace, has the person ever actually shot it? Like, or did you just hope that when you push that button, like some gooey stuff is gonna come out and hit the bad guy and certainly it'll hit them right in the face. We don't think about wind blowing. We don't think about where the mace is and how long it actually takes to get mace ready to, to shoot. Uh, all these things that we don't think about, right? So if you want to carry this kind of stuff, I'm not saying absolutely not, but what I'm saying is don't think that this one thing, this one device is 100% always gonna keep us safe. We want to teach our kids how they can rely on nothing else but themselves to keep themselves safe. So, so we have some questions from the audience. So how, how do you make, this is a good one, how do you make your kids aware without terrifying them? Yeah. And like, what are some of the, uh, I'm combining a couple of questions here, what are specific words you can use to talk to your kids that way? Yeah, um, obviously it's, it's age appropriate. appropriate. Kind of like what, what, she, what the doctor was saying, <clears throat> you're gonna use different terms when they're little than when they're adult, um, or excuse me, when they're college kids or whatever. Um, what I did with my kids when they were little, and I still do it, um, they get annoyed by it now, but what I used to do was we would talk about how to stay safe, just, and not with any, um, bad guys are gonna get you, get not like that, but we talk about it, and then we turn it into a game. So when we would drive places, we would do these competitions, those probably, is not healthy in retrospect, <laughs> but it works. Um, so we play games, you know, what would you do if? And we talk about what would you do if you were at a store and you got lost, who could you go to? And then my kid's like, oh, do this, or this. And, and it's just a game to them, right? If they're remembering these things, but it's not so scary where we're sitting down in the kitchen, I'm like, listen, there are bad guys in the world and they are most certainly gonna get you. Like that's not gonna, that doesn't help, right? So for us, the ongoing dialogue, and it wasn't super strange for my kids because they've been hearing it since they were three. Nobody's allowed to touch your body and, and not, because we, I don't say it in a scary way, but because that's a fact, right? No, one's, no one can touch your body. And then once you start the conversation, people get, I think, I think adults get much more nervous about scaring their kids than what actually happens when you just have the dialogue. The older kids, she was, she was talking about, 
be straightforward, and, and I would have to agree. If you, when your kid's ready to go to college, like, no, we're gonna talk about this, right? Because it'd be much easier to stick our head in the sand and not talk about it. We're gonna talk about sexual assault on campus, and here's what it is, and here's what happened. What happens, um, just having that conversation, I think, um, is, is 100 times better than doing nothing. Yeah, and just being ready for it. Yeah, any, yeah. At any given moment, like, bedtime when you're exhausted and you really want to just have them go to bed. Mm -hmm. That's just my personal experience. How do you approach conversations differently with boys and girls? Obviously, um, different conversations. Different conversations, but um, and not so different. Okay. Um, my kid, so I have a boy and a girl, and I've had the same conversation with both of them at the same time. I, I, haven't, I haven't separated. I think that, um, I mean, statistically speaking, is it more likely that a woman is going to be sexually assaulted? Absolutely, right? Absolutely. However, statistically speaking, that doesn't mean my male child won't be sexually abused before he's an adult, or doesn't mean that he's immune to something happening to him when he's younger, or excuse me, older. So I really haven't separated it. Also because I want my male child to know that this is not acceptable, right? This, this isn't what men do. Men are amazing, and they and like, daddy, you know, they do all these great things good guys don't do these are just specific bad guys right and so i think it's important to have him have boys be part of that dialogue also yeah for sure oh lots of questions so we'll just keep plowing through elaborate this is this is kind of going off of that one how kids especially girls are thinking what are they thinking when they turn away from those healthy fears like i don't want to be rude mm -hmm. um lots of elaborate so, um, on the, uh, in Gavin DeBecker's book, Gift of Fear, he talks about something that I saw happen time and time again. And when we, and when we say this, this is in no way victim blaming. We've all seen what that looks like, and that's not what this is. But often people who are victimized, women who are victimized, who are sexually assaulted, they will tell you something when you're talking to them. They will say, you know what, right before this something bad happened, there, I, just, I just knew. I, I knew something went, was going wrong and I thought I was being too sensitive or I was being too judgy or I was being ridiculous, right? And often they won't be able to articulate, like, what was that? It might be a, a glimpse in the eye, it might be a change of a tone, it's very, very, very small, but what they were feeling was their gift of fear, right? And they push it down and then sometimes, you know, bad things happen. Um, but we've been taught not to be rude and not to be um, judgy and not to be so sensitive. Well, that's a gift that we need to learn how to use. Maybe looking for a personal example. Like we had one time, and I told this story, where's note song? I told this story one time at, at one of our uh, panel discussions. We had a, a woman come up to us at a, a fast food restaurant, and she was chatting with the kids. She was an older woman. It was very sweet. And then she said, can I have one of your french fries to my, like, four-year-old? And I I said, and it made the hair on my arms stand up, and I, you know, I didn't know how to react. And we, yeah. we eventually moved on. Point of the story being, afterwards, we got in the car, and I said to the boys, did that make your tummy feel funny? And they said, yes. Perfect. Yep. Bingo. Mm -hmm. Way to say, that's the instinct, right? Yes, absolutely. Talking to them about sometimes we hear things, it doesn't mean you're nuts, right? Or the feeling in your tummy, or the hair on the back of your neck, or your arm. Like, what is that? And we yes. talk about... It's a gift. Like this is how we've been gifted this to stay alive. Really, we think like right. primitive time. That's what all this is. But when we can't put a name to it, it's really hard to encourage that when they don't understand what's happening with yeah, our you body. You don't know because you never. Mm -hmm. you, it's hard to. You can't just make that up. Right. You have to experience it. Mm -hmm. So talk. Here's a good question. Are you familiar with the X plan uh, to help kids get out of unsafe social situations? What do you think of those types of things? It's the. Do you know what it is? No. It's, I think it's, it was developed by a guy who's had teenagers and said, just text me an X if you're in trouble. Um, and someone <clears throat> in the family will respond. What do okay. you think of that uh, type of I mean, I think, I think any communication that you have set up is fantastic. I don't think there are so many. Like There, there are apps um, out that are great for kids um, who are walking in, in college campuses. Like They have a night class, and, mm -hmm. and of course, we always suggest having a buddy system, but the reality is sometimes buddies didn't take the same class you have, right? So well, there are all kinds of apps that you can use now on your phone that your location services, and if, if you do a cer certain thing on the app that something sends to the local police department and five of your friends, um, there are, there are good ones out there. The X, um, I suppose it would be good, but if, I, I think of all the, um, but what if they just, you know, butt dialed the phone? 
or and, wh and yeah. what are you going to do if right. you're a Madison and your child goes to college in, in Indiana what are you going to you get an X well I'm in Madison you know you want the local people to know right the local police department or, or their local um, friends or whomever it's mm -hmm. good to know anyway but I think I would maybe go a little bit further than just an X be, be prepared mm -hmm. for not what if someone doesn't show up? Yeah. Yeah. A um, couple of questions that are similar. Ways to mo parenting issues, monitoring your kid's behavior versus alienating them. Mm -hmm. um, it's such a delicate situation. How do you create the expectation that you'll look through their stuff and yet give them privacy? Talk yeah. a little about that. So I'm a little nervous about my parenting now that I saw the... Um, lady talking about authoritative, but my <laughs> style of parenting. And <laughs> I think you're good. I took notes. Um, but when people ask me that and I go to mom groups, I know that there are people on all spectrums, right? There's people who are like, no, I'm on it all the time. And then there's people like, we free range our kids or whatever. <clears throat> I don't think that you can say either is right or wrong. It's what works for your family. What I do, what I would recommend is if I pay for your phone, your, your phone is, is mine. Like that, that's my phone. And I am, for right now, I'm your mom. I, I'm not your friend. And I know that that kind of rubs people. That's just how we do it in my house. Um, if I own it, it's my phone. And I love you so much that I'm gonna risk you being mad at me. Because you know maybe when you're 25, we'll be buds. But when you're 13, like, I'm your mom. And that's just how it is. It gets now, tougher. Does, it, it is, and that doesn't mean that they're not going to go somewhere else and get phones, and, and that kind of opens up the whole dialogue. But the hope is that this has been, um, this is just how you do it in your family. You, you don't know any other way, right? Every kid's different. I know that too. So I think you have to be ready to um, pivot if needed. <laughs> pivot? Pivot a lot. <laughs> Uh, here's a question. As a grandparent, how can I get through to my daughters in the 40-year-old age, 40 year old age range that they need to take predator danger seriously? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's a really interesting question because people in their 40s, like me, um, I mean, we're on social media, right? And it's fine because all of our friends are there and we post pictures of our kids and, and many of my friends are really loosey-goosey kind of with this stuff. <clears throat> I think the best couple things to do is, well, like have them email me. But beyond that, all those online resources that we were talking about, find something you think would speak to your 40 something year old child. Even on YouTube, YouTube has fantastic um, videos. They're like kind of like PSAs, but they really put it in your face like a regular family and this is how the bad guy gets in. And I feel like the video, and I show some of the videos and some of my presentations and I feel like that seeing how it happens is re really gets people on like, oh my, like that was just like my family, right? Like mm -hmm. this is what I would do. So I think looking at those resources and not giving up, like yeah. don't just keep at it. And it kind of gets to, I'm, they're still your parent, right? right? Like, I'm, your, I'm your mom, <laughs> you need to know this. Same conversation, different generation. I love you, that's yes. why I'm doing this to yes. you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Very. You are going to listen to me again. <laughs> Sit down. Um, what are some of the most popular or common websites where predators are connecting with kids? Mm. All and any. <laughs> um, when certain websites get um, known for predators being there, um, it's too late, one. Um, and they might shut it down or they might change um, security features. Anywhere a child has Nickelodeon websites, Sesame Street websites, go all the way down to little kids, right? If we think about it, that's where they hang out, right? They hang out where our children are. So any, just, and, and not to, you know, I don't say that to, to terrify people of the internet, but just know and understand that you don't know everybody online. And our kids have been taught that, but it's just a really hard concept mm -hmm. for them to grasp. So I think that's when we need to be engaged. Um, and when we're engaged, it doesn't mean you have to know everything about every app, right? Mm -hmm. I think that it's important to do that research like I showed you, but ask your kid. Like, my children, I don't know about yours, but my children love it when they think they're smarter than I am. Right, the re and the reality is, I just looked it up, so I already know. We're gonna sit down, because I am so dumb. You guys, I'm old, like I have bifocal contacts, I can't, and, and play that up, because kids love that. They love to teach you something, they also love to think that they're smarter than you. So play that card, right? Right, we, we, we made our kids teach us how to use Snapchat, so 
they, you know, they like to know how stupid you are. Yes, like, oh, they love it. Dad, mm -hmm. duh, don't you know? So now <laughs> we have Snapchat accounts. <laughs> don't know what to do with them. But at what age does my child need a cell phone? Oh, yeah. Take People a seat, everyone. <laughs> like, this is going to take about 30 minutes. No. <laughs> I, um, everybody wants like an age and, um, it's and hard. so do I, because I don't know, <laughs> the expert doesn't know, but the reality is I think that every, uh, the only thing we can say about that is every child's different. And when you are looking <laughs> at cell phones, uh, understand and remember that there are different options. So if you are, if your child is ready for a cell phone, because maybe you're not home when they get home from school and you want to check in, that's, that's a great, you know, a great thing. There are all different types of cell phones and all different types of plans that you can get specifically for children. You do not need to give them an iPhone 10. I mean, which, which would be nice. I'm going to be your friend. If that, but you, there's all different kinds of phones. So figure out for your child what is best and also understand that they're probably doing stuff on other phones anyways, right? Um, I have two kids, complete polar opposites. I have a son who is 11 and is quite immature. I have a girl who is nine going on 32, right? So it just, I think every, it just depends on every child. As long as when you give it to them, you still have rules and we still talk about safety, how we need to stay safe on that phone. Talk a little bit about having conversations with kids about dating violence. Mm -hmm. And with the, the healthy relationships, um, it's, well, first, I think that, that that starts when they're little, right? That starts when they're little, we talk about healthy relationships. But let's say it didn't start when they're little, and that's all right, too. I don't think there's any, well, sorry, you missed the cutoff, right? They're 13, you should have had this conversation before. That's not how it works. So, but talking to them about respecting each other, and, the, and I think it's as important to talk to our boys about healthy relationships as it is to talk to our girls. Mm -hmm. And when we just have things are, this is not acceptable. Like, like there's no discussion. We never touch each other when, when we get angry, right? Teaching them how to have that, um, those conversations that are not easy, right? And, and listen, I had a hitter. So <laughs> I had a child who would strike out whenever he got frustrated or, or and I'm like, what am I, when, what, what am I doing? But it actually gave us a really good opportunity to talk about we don't hit people. Even when people make us angry, we don't hit them. Um, and then as they have gotten older, I, for us, what has worked has been talking about strong, for my son specifically, has been talking about strong men. So we talk about his dad, and he wants to be his dad, but then we give examples to all these other types of men in his life. People at church, people on the news, right? This is what men do, and this is how they behave, and we don't do any of these unhealthy relationships, and what does that mean? And then for my daughter, same thing, but also we don't accept, like we, no matter what you, if you're a girl, or you're a boy or whatever, we do not accept that verbal um, back and forth. If it's not even physical, it can be verbal, right? That's not acceptable in our family. And I feel like when we, when we just talk about it, it opens up that, um, that Pandora's box of what's acceptable. And then also, if you have found that, that your daughter or your son is, is involved in an unhealthy relationship that you didn't see coming or, you know, I taught them all this kind of stuff, um, address it. Like, I, I firmly believe this is not a time to be a friend. Like, this is step in as soon as you know. And it doesn't matter. Maybe they did this person for two years and, oh my gosh, I didn't know and I'm being rude. Get in it. Like, get, get, get in it. Even if your child's an adult, you know, unhealthy relationships are incredibly disastrous. So I think as parents, it's our job, no matter how old our children is, to address that kind of issue. Yeah, tough. Um, human trafficking, you wanna to touch on that? Yeah. Thoughts? Um, so I, I work with a, um, an agency in St. Louis. I, I actually, we had a meeting yesterday <clears throat> called The Covering House, which is um, a model for the United States, which is great. But I get a lot, a lot, it, from my family too, but I get lots of text messages or emails saying, you know, this, um, and it's usually a Facebook post or an Instagram post or whatever, and they're saying at this this particular university, which is to every university, um, you know, these guys were seen uh, two days ago and they're trying to grab people from from the street and like put them in human trafficking. And is this real? Like, should I? What do I? What do I do about this? So, <clears throat> my experience with human trafficking when I was an agent, I we would work uh, Super Bowls and, and Las Vegas stuff looking for traffickers, and it is a big business. 
But if we think about if you, going back to if you were a bad guy, what would you do? Bad guys don't want to get caught, right? And we talked about how they can, um, our kids walk out of the front door. They don't have to come in. So if you're a bad guy who didn't want to get caught and you knew you could get super easy victims right on the internet who would walk to you, why would you take the risk of going out and snatching people because they looked good? Does it happen? Absolutely it happens. I'd say 10%, between seven and 10%, right? It's very unlikely. So it's on the news and it's terrifying and that's why it's on the news. It's a horrible thing. Does it happen? Sure it does. But the majority of these girls go straight to their traffickers. And I think something also interesting to, to remember is that we talked about that psychology. That's exactly what traffickers use, right? So they go, and when we go to um, get them out, get these, these kids out, people have this idea that it's like uh, how it is in Thailand, right? So you go in, and there's like a big bus, and they're like, thank you for saving us. That's not how it works. Many of these girls, because of the psychological stuff that's going on and their families and all this other stuff, they're not interested in being rescued. So understand, it's almost like being in a cult-ish kind of situation. When we get them out, they need to be deprogrammed and, and, and learn this is not what love is and this is not a healthy relationship. As strange as it sounds to us, they, they almost always want to stay, right? And, and for every child takes a different amount of time to get them out. But it's not one of these, let's bust down the door and get the girls and we're gonna run away and they're just gonna follow our rules. That's not generally how, how it works. So um, I think that plus opening, if you see strange things and you have any question about what you've seen, maybe in your community or whatever, ask the local PD. My problem there is that lots of them are not, like human trafficking is not something that um, lots of communities directly deal with. But when you're seeing someone who has been trafficked, you're gonna see stuff like they have nothing. So they have no money, they have no driver's license, they have no credit cards, they, ha they are always going to this particular person for food, they're not in school and they should be in school, um, they are, look gaunt because they use food as a manipulation tool. Um, any, you know, we see things like that and if we hear, listen to our intuition, right? Listen to it, like just listen to it. The, what's the worst that can happen? Make, it, make an anonymous call, hopefully something happens, right? But I feel like, um, it, it, what's the harm? Now don't go straight up to the trafficker and be like, are you trafficking? Like that would be a poor choice, don't do that. But go you know, to your law enforcement people and just say, hey, this is what I saw, here's the license plate number, maybe it's nothing, but, but maybe it is. Um, and there's, there, um, trafficking is, is, a, is an inter interesting problem. Um, Covering House Inc. in St. Louis has, uh, if you go to their website, they have great uh, resources on their website about um, best ways to respond to that and, and how it works. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a great resource. Mm. Wow, it's a very interesting. So last question, guys. Um, I think we'll <clears throat> we had a couple extras we didn't get to, but I think we'll, I think we'll end with your thoughts about hugging and, you know, go hug Uncle Jim goodnight because that's what we do. Mm -hmm. And just talk a little bit about that. Sure, sure. So um, we teach them to respect their body. We have to respect their, their body. That's a, that's a big deal, right? If we're saying no one has a right to touch you, but then I go make you hug Uncle Joe before bed and I yell at you if you don't, and if you're making faces, you're just being rude and I regret. That happens all the time and it's not because parents are trying to do anything psychologically damaging to their child, right? Basically, just what we have been taught to do. Don't be rude, but that's another one of those. Just, kid, forget how you're feeling and just go hug this person and don't be rude. If we violate or if we allow people to violate their bodies and it's really difficult for their little brains to understand how, you know, well, you just told me that I had, this person had to touch me and, and this person didn't. And it's so confusing, right? It's so confusing. And I'm not saying it's not embarrassing sometimes when your kid says, he's like, no, I don't, it, okay, that's embarrassing and it's happened to me. And you know, you, what I have said to my kids is like, don't be rude, but you know, sorry, Joe. And, and there's no like, we, we, the last thing you ever want to do is force a child to physically touch someone they do not want to physically touch. I don't care if it's Santa Claus, right? Yeah. Anybody, because we're teaching them, we respect them. Sometimes is that embarrassing? Yeah, and then we say to Joe, eh, sorry, Joe, you know, nine. Like, whatever you need to say, but respect their body like we're asking them to respect themselves. It makes such good sense. Yeah. I mean, it really does. And now as I have teenagers looking back, I can assure you it will pass. 
Yeah. They won't, they won't, they'll hug them someday. Right. It just won't happen that day. Right. Yeah. At that That's bedtime. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're just Thank a wealth of information. She's so cute and so awesome. It's hard to imagine you interrogating any bad guy because you do look like a second grade teacher. Uh, so once again, thank you to Heather, uh, both of our speakers today, of course, and to all of, all of you for spending uh, the morning with us here, taking time to come into beautiful downtown Madison. Uh, we encourage you, uh, as Heather said, to keep the conversation going. Uh, don't feel embarrassed to talk to the other moms and grandmoms in your neighborhood or online because there's power in numbers. We learn from each other. It's not embarrassing to ask questions. Um, it's, it's good. It's good that we talk to each other and share our questions and our issues. Um, we hope you'll share the information from today. This event has been recorded, so it will live in infamy. Hopefully we did okay, Heather. <laughs> you can access the presentations at uh, the WWHF YouTube channel. Uh, and of course you will be getting an email, so you'll, we'll, we'll share all this information with you. Um, and fun stuff now before we go. What? Oh, can I? Well, I just have a Yes, one. jump this in, baby. This is why I'm their agent and the business pro. If you have any questions, my email and stuff was up there, my social media, everything. Please feel free to reach out to me. Like, it's not weird. I mean, I'm just like a normal mom, right? So please email me or contact me via social media um, with any questions that you have. If you think that there's a group that I can benefit, I have my cards back here, but, but please reach out if there's anything I can help you with. Just another mom resource in our arsenal. I love it. So now you'll hear from us like incessantly. Is this normal? Is this normal? I love Wisconsin. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay. Okay. So now some fun stuff. Kind of heavy conversations today. So we'll shake it off a little bit before we send you guys out. You may have noticed there's a gift bag on your table. So if you're at a table with other people, if you're by yourself, woohoo, you won the gift bag. If you're with other people, you don't have to arm wrestle for it. There should be a notebook on your table with a little green dot on the back. So that should settle the debate. Bait. whoever has the green dot wins or you can you know take bit the highest bidder from your table so yay you get to go home uh, with a gift bag um, just spoiler alert I'm gonna tell you what's in there they're little cards that are conversation cards so it is a great way to get conversations going in your home and make it more like a game rather than mom lecture number 101 so thank you guys very much. Have a great day. Thanks to Heather and everybody else and all of the Wisconsin Women's Health Foundation folks who were here. Thanks, everybody.